lost budget. I have the joy of sitting on the budget committee, so if you're still here in three hours' time and I'm still talking about budget, then uh, <laughs> it's because I like talking about budget. However, I'll try not to. Um, one of the things that comes up around the budget is all the accounts haven't been signed off. They have. The uh, seven years of accounts up to 2013 have been signed off, and we're in the process of signing off the 2014 accounts. So, you know, it is just not true that the accounts haven't been signed off. <coughs> As I mentioned, I sit on budget committee. There is also a budget control committee that looks at how the money has been sent, spent and signed <coughs> off, and making sure it's been spent responsibly. Uh, so that does happen. Uh, there is something, a body called the Court of Auditors, whose job it is to track the spending of the European Union money and making sure it is spent well and uh, it is spent in the way that it was said it would be spent. So there is a lot of oversight of the money being spent well and properly. And indeed, we are now talking about something called uh, performance budgeting as well, which is about how we uh, plan budgeting too. So it is something that is a hell of a lot better than the Kippers will tell you it is, and it is something that we are working on continuously to make sure it is uh, public money is well spent. Excuse me. <coughs> I don't think that really covers off the, the accounts issue because they may well have been signed off now, but as you said, there's seven years where they weren't signed off. No, 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 the last seven years up to 2013, the seven years before 2013 were all individually, those years were signed off. And the Court of Auditors does a very detailed report. It is less than 1% of the EU's funds that are lost to fraud, uh, which is less than most member states' loss to fraud. <laughs> and you know, uh, there are error, errors in spending, again, of about the same level that happens in individual member states. So you know, over 80% of the EU budget is spent by member states. So through the common agricultural policy or um, some of the regional spending and that kind of thing. So the accounts have been signed off. One question. Uh, you said some, some money has been lost or something. What, what do you mean there? No, errors and fraud. I said there's a tiny, less than 1% that is lost to fraud, which is less than most member states lose to fraud. So less than most national governments lose to fraud. Uh, and then there are errors, but again, those are the sort of error rate you would get it that aren't fraud, but mistakes that are made in accounts or whatever. And again, that is the same sort of level that you would get with national government spent. So, you know, these are just accounting. That's an accounting term, and as I say, it is, it reflects, right. I know you've got your hand up. We've got two sheets of paper to go through. Just a general point. You talked about all new countries, but what's the rate in the UK? Because that's what people are going to be interested in. And that's a very good question, and I don't have the answer to that, but I will go away and check. Um, but it, I'm pretty sure, actually, the UK's rate is higher than that, so... <laughs> so uh, right. Democratic deficit. I am now just going to go through the two sheets, otherwise we'll spend all morning on just these two sheets. Um, democratic deficit. Right. I am stood in, I am stood in uh, front of you as your Labour directly elected member of the European Parliament. Uh, so you know, you've got elected politicians that sit in the European Parliament. You also have the European Council, the, which is where the Prime Ministers and Presidents meet. It's what's meeting on Thursday and Friday next week to agree the renegotiation package. Uh, but equally, that then has different meetings, depending whether it's the finance ministers, whether it's the environment ministers, all of these meet regularly and are co-legislators with the European Parliament. So both these bodies, no legislation exists without the European Parliament and the Council of Ministers signing it off. And the point about that is that when you see national ministers going into the Daily Mail going, oh, Brussels has done this, chances are they were sat in the room. Or if they weren't personally, their predecessor was. You know, that there has been that sign-off um, through that democratic process and that democratic accountability. 
I would argue that those ministers ought to go before select committees in the House of Commons before they go out and say what their mandate is and what they intend to negotiate in these uh, in those council meetings. And actually, the transparency needs to happen a lot more in the UK uh, rather than the lack of democracy at the European Union level. Right, fact check, emotional arguments, uh, and that side of things. There, you, I think you are right, because you are going to hear facts on one side, facts on the other side, this is what it costs, this is what come back to the cost. But you know, you're going to hear all of this bandying around of statistics. And the reality is, it's that kind of emotional end that actually will get people to the polling station. Uh, yeah. For example, on the cost, you will hear the Kipper say it costs X millions per year, I think 370 million a year or whatever the current figure is. The CBI says that households benefit by £3,000 per year. Uh, <coughs> if you look at your tax returns and Osborne, for whatever reason that he chose to do this, uh, Every year you now get a pie chart of how your uh, tax is spent. And within that, there is a tiny, tiny slither that is the contribution to the European Union, uh, which is far too small for them to actually write on it what that uh, spend is. It's a kind of separate arrow out. So you know, the cost is minimal in terms of um, that, that breakdown of where your taxes are generally spent. Uh, but this is, where, this is where we have to win the arguments, and uh, we'll work through that this morning as well. It is that, uh, that emotional, right, uh, emotional arguments. Uh, Eurozone crisis, and um, the, the, you know, sort of the, that side of things, we don't actually now contribute to any bailouts that happen. Uh, there's a whole separate set of legislation that's going on around uh, the banks in the Eurozone that is being talked about at a European level at this point. Um, and, but you know, never let us forget that this is actually, you know, the EU exists as a market. It is crucially a market with rules, but it is in our interests that the EU does well. <laughs> because that's where we sell our things to. <laughs> and so, you know, pretending that the Eurozone doesn't matter to us, that it's over there somewhere, um, is not actually something that makes economic sense. However, you know, part of this renegotiation, and indeed, uh, historically, there, we are not a part of those bailouts as such. Patriotism and sovereignty. Uh, right. I will probably deal with patriotism <coughs> on the next sheet because actually I think it is an argument for in rather than an argument for out in terms of our place in the world. Uh, this sovereignty point as well, and this will come, and this is going to be the recurrent theme, what does out look like? And we don't know is the absolute truth. No, the Leave people have not defined what out looks like. There is a very entertaining video on uh, the Remain campaign's website where they pull out all the different outs, versions of out that the uh, various people who want to leave have expressed. It includes Norway, uh, where they pay 80% per capita of the UK contribution to the European Union so that they can access the markets of the European Union. But they don't have a seat in the Council of Ministers. They don't have directly politi elected politicians, so they don't have that say over how laws are made, but they still have to obey those laws. It's called government by golden facts by some Norwegians. Shows you how old that phrase is. Um, but the, the idea of sovereignty, actually, that to me is less sovereignty, not more. <laughs> um, you know, if we want to access the European Union market, why would they say, oh, why would other European Union countries go, yeah, you can access our market, of course you can, but no, you don't have to live up to our standards. That's just not a realistic out 
model. So that whole point about sovereignty, I think, is actually strengthened by our continuing membership of the European Union. I will put this bit here with the patriotism thing. Do not believe the, again, the kippers and the leave people who say that somehow, yeah, we're just 128th or, um, yeah, we're this kind of minor pair. And I think this was a really good point that you made in terms of, you know, firstly, actually, being that English language country and we are central to uh, the links from the rest of the world into the EU, but also we are a really important country inside the EU and we are, um, and I think it diminishes us, you know, that uh, these people are trying to make us seem insignificant inside the <coughs> European Union. Quite how they think we will then miraculously become hugely significant outside of the European Union, if they think we can't pull our weight inside the EU, is one that I've not heard any of them explain. Uh, TTIP. The Transatlantic Trade and Investment Partnership, if anyone in this room hasn't heard of it, it is a proposed trade deal between the EU and the US. Uh, quite wide-ranging in terms of what's being discussed at the moment. It's been... The talks started before I was elected, uh, and one of the things I will say about this is the talks are likely to go on for very much longer as well. <laughs> you know, there is no imminent TTIP deal being done. But, two things on this. One is Labour MEPs have very clear red lines around this trade deal. Firstly, our <coughs> public services and protecting our public services. And on the public, including obviously the NHS, on the public services point, individual countries can opt things out of trade deals that the EU does. They can opt areas out, so services of general interest you know, is one of the technical terms around this. Countries all around Europe put chapters, reams of paper in going, right, we don't want this trade deal to cover this, 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 all this. The UK put in half a page. That's what our UK government did, and that tells you Two things. One is, keep campaigning to your MPs about this, because uh, yeah, that's, that's the sole uh, responsibility of the national government. Uh, if the national government hasn't done that, we can't. And the second thing is that that tells you what the UK government would do with a trade deal if it was outside the European Union. We, they have said they will sign up with bells and whistles to uh, a TTIP deal. So out doesn't save us from TTIP. Out makes us more vulnerable to TTIP. The other red lines are the um, something called the ISDS, which is the Investor to State Dispute Settlement Mechanism. It's a corporate tribunal system. ISDS mechanisms are in trade deals going back decades. It's not a new phenomenon. Um, it is, you know, the history of it was that if countries, uh, companies were wanted to invest in developing countries, but there wasn't a kind of legislative stability in those countries, then it would provide some protections. But the problem that we have is that uh, that is not the scenario that you're talking about with the EU and the US. We have very mature corporate legal systems on either side of the Atlantic. Nobody's yet convinced me we don't need an I that we need a separate legal mechanism for companies. The other the remaining two are red lines for Labour MEPs are standards, both in terms of employment standards, so we make sure we protect both EU and actually promote labour rights for people in the US. And the second thing is environmental and food standards. Because both of those sets of standards are hard won and we need to keep them. Uh, and those are very clear red lines. So, across Europe, people, citizens, are concerned about TTIP. And because there is democracy across Europe, where citizens are objecting in Austria, in Germany, in the Netherlands, in France, their elected politicians, directly elected like MEPs or their national ministers, are going, oh, 
no, perhaps you, though perhaps we can't let you do this. And as I say, if it was just left up to the UK government, they'd get on with it. CAP and fishing. Uh, very quickly, uh, the NFU, the National Farmers Union, has said only 10% of farmers would survive without the Common Agricultural Policy. So, you know, our farming in our countryside actually depends on the Common Agricultural Policy. It has changed a huge amount. It is much more environmentally focused now as well, which is a good thing. We have more hedgerows now because of the European Union. Uh, but it is actually something farmers rely on hugely. And fishing. I remember when I was a child and I used to go on holiday in Cornwall and they had Russian vacuum ships that would come in and would just hoover everything up, irrespective of what it was hoovering up, and then pick out, pick out the bits that they wanted to use and sell. The fishing policies are about conservation of stocks in many ways, and ensuring that we have fishing into the future. Uh, you know, I can go on about that. But... Do you want to stop a news flash on that figure on fraud that David has oh, found? Oh, brilliant. <laughs> so... National Fraud Authority, this is for the UK, I take it. Mm -hmm. Government and public sector, 20.6? Billion. Billion? Which is? 3.63%. <laughs> I knew it was going to be more, I didn't realise it was going to be that much more. <laughs> Thank you, Dave. <laughs> Brilliant. <laughs> Uh, right, so yeah, these are some of the issues that are going to come up, and these are some of the, the responses that we've uh, had to that. The benefits. Workers' rights. For those of you that don't know me, I was a trade union official, I worked for Unite, uh, and I was an official for 20 years before I was elected in May 2014. Workers' rights is the reason I'm standing here in front of you now. Throughout all of that time, I started working for the union, uh, before 1997, and the European Union was the only way that I could protect members or indeed advance members' rights through uh, the European Court of Justice. Uh, Part-time workers, health and safety rights, equality rights, you, know, you name it, the, there was some way, that, well, we tried some ways to, to move things forward and indeed to protect. And you only have to look at what happened in the coalition government when supposedly the Lib Dems were holding back the Tories. And you see that things like unfair dismissal, the qualification period for that extended from 12 months to two years, to know what would happen if we didn't have at least some of our employment rights underpinned by the European Union. It's absolutely vital. And God knows what we're dealing with right now with the trade union bill is... Uh, an indication enough. Those, those rights would be eroded like, you know, like a hot knife through butter if the Tories were left to it. Uh, jobs. This is, this is going to be the headline. This is you know, what the bottom line of this is. <coughs> the economy, you know, as Bill Clinton once said, it's the economy stupid. I think that was Bill Clinton. It was. It was. <laughs> um, you know, this is about actually the state of our economy. It is about the fact that we are a bridge into the EU, the English-speaking bridge into the EU. So we get a lot of foreign direct investment from outside the EU, and that was mentioned in terms of the car plants, Nissan, Honda, BM, well, BMW is from inside the EU, uh, that um, we have that. We have in this region, actually, the Southwest is the biggest aerospace manufacturing region in uh, the UK. Not many people know that, but it's true. Uh, and a lot of those companies are actually European-owned. So you have Airbus up in Bristol, which is uh, a Franco-German company. Or you have Augusta Westland in Yeovil, which is an Italian-owned company. Uh, and you have both the good quality, well-paid, secure jobs within those companies, but you also have supply, supply chains around those companies. But those are kind of headline companies. It doesn't take into account the whole strata of jobs and industry and economy that kind of happens below that as well as a consequence of that trade that happens and benefits the whole of the uh, British economy. With that trade goes jobs. That's crucially important. And financial services, it's, um, it's true. I was speaking to an organisation called the Alliance for Finance yesterday, which is the finance sector trade union. So uh, I used to go to it as an officer, I'm now, uh, now, now turning up as uh, talking to them as a politician. 
but they, uh, you know, there are all sorts of reasons why the finance sector is in favour of continued membership of the mm -hmm. EU. And I think there was an interview with the chief executive of Royal Bank of Scotland on Newsnight last night that I caught, which is kind of uh, going, yes, we need to stay inside the EU. But actually there are also, post-2008, financial legislation being put in place to ensure that we don't repeat what happened before 2008 as well, so that we don't wind up with that systemic risk of the finance sector um, being too big to fail, or individual companies in the finance sector being too big to fail. Uh, cultural links, absolutely. Um, you know, there's, uh, you know, we are actually much more European than we think we are as well. When you, uh, when people go outside the EU and go and live and work in other countries beyond, they suddenly think, oh, actually, we're quite European. <laughs> but there are those enormous cultural links, and those are increasing as well. Uh, and it was said about young people going to university or studying or working abroad. I went to work abroad, I went to work in Portugal when I was in the restaurant trade when I was younger in the 1980s. Uh, but there's that, that intermingling. Uh, you just have to look at the history of our royal family, for goodness sake. You know, good number of them actually didn't have English as their first language. <laughs> they hadn't spoken German or French for a lot of years. Uh, so yeah, but there are those cultural links. International cooperation, hugely, hugely important. You hear the expression, and again, it was, uh, in my view, a straw man in Cameron's renegotiation, this opting out of ever closer union. The language in the treaty is it's ever, and it's a preamble as well, so it's not the part of the legislative script, but it's ever closer union of the peoples of Europe, comma, but decisions being made at the appropriate level. And that's the thing to remember. The important thing is, where you need legislation in this ever-shrinking world of ours to deal with those international situations, then it is appropriate and effective to legislate at a European level. But it is equally appropriate and to legislate at a national level and actually we're one of the most centralised countries in the EU. So yeah, we don't legislate enough at a local level in this country. And that may to some extent be feeding into the, some of the Euro scepticism. But so where we're dealing with issues like climate change, you're not going to tackle climate change in the UK effectively and completely. You have to deal with it on an international basis. And the EU has been a leading actor in take, taking the lead in dealing with climate change. But also, you have issues, very topically at the moment, like tax avoidance. And companies saying they make all their profit, you know, uh, pay their tax in one country, but trade in another country. And we are dealing, getting legislation in place at a European Union level. One of my colleagues, the Labour MEP for the South East of England, Annalisa Dodds, uh, wrote a report before Christmas, which was uh, around this, and the Commission has followed up on some of the proposals, uh, which is around transparency. That companies have to declare where they make money and have to declare where they're paying tax and that these, this information has to be shared uh, across those borders, really importantly. And that is how we get these companies to pay their way in the societies that they are um, getting the benefits of the public expenditure through. So tax avoidance, absolutely. EU workers, freedom of movement, and uh, the positives of that, as well as uh, the expats, who were suddenly waking up to the fact that they might quite like us to stay inside the European Union uh, for very personal reasons. Um, I'm going to do security and peace last. Trade and standards. So trade, we've talked about briefly, standards. It's a market with rules. So when you had the horse meat crisis, and you know, lasagnas, I think, was the, uh, the prime product in relation to this, uh, you know, it wasn't, you had to say where the product was from, but what was not so clear was the ingredients of that product. 
And so, and you had things coming through from different countries, which were then compiled in one country. So now there is traceability of those ingredients in those products. Health and safety standards uh, for those products, yeah, the kind of environmental standards, really important environmental standards. You know, the Southwest, we have the most beautiful region in Europe, as I keep telling all my colleagues in the Parliament. And it is really important we have protected environmental standards. And we need to make sure they stay protected. Because again, you know, this the last government tried selling off our forests. I don't see this government being the champion of protecting our environment. And we, were, we need to stand up against that. Which, to some extent, we've dealt with protection against Tory reforms. The union, the consequences of out. If we vote to leave the EU, there is an almost certainty that the, the, with the polling, the polling is sufficiently clear in Scotland not to have a margin of error within it, uh, that means that the Scotland, Scotland will vote to stay inside the EU. It is a perfect excuse with a continuing Tory government to then us trip over into another referendum in Scotland about their membership of the UK. And I actually am afraid that that time we would lose it, the next time we would lose that referendum. So not only would our place in the world be diminished because uh, we won't be that link, that crucial link into the European Union, but actually will be diminished in an atlas as well. Uh, because we will have lost Scotland. Uh, English-speaking capital of Europe, as you can see, I've already used that several times. <laughs> uh, EHIC, the, uh, when you go abroad, it, yeah, I think it used to be the E111D, but it's now the European Health Insurance Card, means that you can get emergency <coughs> treatment when you go on holiday in Europe. Uh, the cost of Brexit, and again, um, shopping, yeah, absolutely. The, there's a calculation that it will cost £450 more uh, in terms of if we leave for a family's shop uh, uh, each year because of the loss of that freedom of movement, tariff free uh, costs, you know, tariff free produce uh, that we get as well. The research funding and collaboration. You know, the Universities UK, which is the umbrella body for universities, uh, could not be more clear about the significance of the UK's continuing membership of the EU. 16% uh, of their funds come from the European Union, 20% of their academic and research staff come from the European Union. But also, this is, it's not just about, you know, sort of dusty chemists with bunts and burners in a lab somewhere. This is about our future. This is about finding diagnostic tools and treatments for diabetes. This is about what's called additive layer manufacturing, 3D printing as an industrial uh, future. You know, industry 4.0 is the term that's used. This is about our future, our future health, our future economy, and what we will have uh, in years to come. By turning our back on that, we're turning our back on all that investment, which is benefiting SMEs as well as you know, the bigger companies as well. And the incubation that goes on around universities is phenomenal now in terms of supporting uh, next generation companies. Uh, right, uh, influence. Yes, the, again, that point about influence. I am pull this together now, I hope I've answered most of the points, but broadly speaking, I categorise these benefits under three headings. One is the pragmatic, practical reasons for our continuing <coughs> membership, and that is those ways that when we work together, we deliver more for the people of you know, the UK and more widely the people of the European Union. This is about the citizens' benefits that come from uh, the EKIC, that come from the workers' rights, that come from the consumer rights, which I haven't talked about, 
you know, cheap flights, you know, being able to go to Spain for your holiday, uh, you know, there is a long list of those day-to-day -day benefits that we all too often take for granted. Then there are the patriotic case, which is this point about if the Kippers and the Leave people think that somehow we are insignificant in the European Union, how on earth do they think that we're suddenly going to be massively significant outside of the European Union? Personally, we are hugely important in the EU, and our country has a role to play both in the EU and, as has been said, that bridge uh, outside the EU as well. And it is, you know, we've always been an outward-looking nation. And turning our back on our neighbourhood is not something that is going to make the UK any better in any shape, size, or form. And then, finally, is the principal point. And this is the point about peace, basically. This is, you know, as a Labour Party member and a trade unionist, I'm an internationalist. I look out, I believe that we need to work together with people from other countries, and I think we, that delivers so much more than if we stood alone and turned our backs on uh, elsewhere. But we should never either forget what the European Union grew out of, because the 20th century, just that first half of the 20th century, was the bloodiest of uh, recorded history of wars and battles across the, uh, across the continent that we're part of. And it grew out of men saying, and it was mostly men, we can never let this happen again. And since we have had the creation uh, of the European Union, with, you know, it is not perfect, it has its faults, but the one thing that it does is make sure there is communication. Oh boy, do we communicate <laughs> in terms of continuous frames and places where governments and people are talking to each other. And while we are talking to each other, we are not killing each other. We are not at war with each other. And if you look at our near neighbourhood, and you look at what happened in former Yugoslavia in the 1990s, where we saw concentration camps again on you know, European soil. If you look at what is happening in Ukraine right now with Crimea and uh, the, the war that's going on in the east of Ukraine, you are looking at how unstable our country is right now. And we should never take the peace and the stability and the security that the European Union gives us for granted. And that alone is worth standing up for and fighting for. So, thank you, and I will pass back to Kane. <laughs> <laughs>